بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أرحب بكم في الجلسة الخامسة. Good morning. I welcome you at the fifth session of the sixth annual Gulf Studies Forum. This is the first session on the policy changes in the Gulf. I will be chairing this session. In lieu of Mr. Hassan Al Sayed uh, and uh, Ms. Rima Al Sari, also will not be able uh, to be with us today for uh, uh, work reasons. Uh, to my right, I have Dr. Al Habsi, Dr. Hab Ahmad Badran, and Dr. Yusuf Al Bushi will be our speakers for this session. We will begin with Dr. Ahmad Badran. I will, uh, Dr. Badran is Assistant Professor of Public Policy at the Department of International Affairs at the University. He has uh, a PhD in Political Science from Exeter University. He was, uh, he was a former Professor of Public Policy at Exeter. His research focuses on public policy. His most recent uh, article is Revisiting uh, Independence of Regulatory Agencies, Thoughts and Reflections from Egypt's Telecom Sector. published in the Public Policy and Administration Journal in 2017. His, the, uh, Dr. Ahmad's uh, paper is entitled Public Policy Making and Implementation in the Gulf States from a Networking Perspective, Cut, the case of Qatar. Dr. Ahmad, you have 15 minutes. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, distinguished guests. The title of this uh, session is Policy Challenges in the Gulf. Perhaps the main challenge is the changing public policy making environment in, the, in recent times. And here comes the title of my paper which is entitled the government's uh, public policy from the perspective of networks uh, a theoretical approach uh, the case of Qatar uh, my presentation is divided into four points I will start uh, with the change in the environment uh, of uh, public policy making Public policy making is a way in order that, that allows us uh, to develop a deeper understanding uh, with regards to uh, uh, the, uh, to making and implementing uh, policies. And then uh, I will uh, tackle uh, uh, theory and implementation. And then I will uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, policy making. Uh, among the different uh, stakeholders, uh, and I will finish with certain uh, uh, concluding remarks. What is the change that took place in the uh, governance system? There are many aspects that delineate a change in policy making uh, uh, from what it was in the 50s and 60s, which the change from uh, the uh, welfare state model to a regulatory state model. Here, a main change uh, happened uh, between the relation between individual and the state with regards uh, to making and implementing policies. And now we have uh, new players in policy making. These are non-government uh, uh, non, uh, uh, stakeholders, be it NGOs or uh, CSOs. And this role is growing in a matter that formed a challenge in the face of public policy makers in some countries today. They are working in an environment that really drives them to work with the parties according to the traditional model, will not uh, an indigenous part uh, in public policy making implementation, uh, like, for example, civil society organizations and NGOs. For now, this is a main challenge that facing policymakers in many countries, including the Gulf states. Uh, the main observation is that uh, the top-down approach uh, in dealing uh, with new uh, stakeholders, uh, new participants, uh, is not uh, um, 
uh, is not is not positive. This is why we need a participatory model in policy making, and whereby these uh, new parties, new stakeholders, could partake in policy making. Uh, the main question of uh, this uh, paper is how can uh, policy, public policy makers, uh, deal with this new reality. In other words, uh, how can we manage relations uh, and interactions in a governance uh, in the new governance systems that uh, uh, depends on participation between the state on one hand uh, and non-state uh, parties, including uh, private sector and NGOs. And uh, the answer presented by the paper is an answer among a group of answers uh, that we can agree upon or disagree. But the paper believes uh, that the perspective uh, of public policy networks, uh, this uh, perspective uh, can uh, give us a deeper understanding uh, of uh, the of public policy making and implementation. This is uh, the hypothesis, or actually, this is a statement of this paper. I don't know if you agree, but what my paper said is that uh, this uh, uh, this aspect of policy making allows us to develop a deep understanding uh, with regards to public policy making and impl implementation in reality. Accordingly, the main thesis of my paper is that in order uh, to reach a deep understanding for uh, public policy making and impl implementation, uh, we have to determine uh, public policy networks and then we have to study what happens within the center with regards to interactions and relations between the different uh, uh, parties that are uh, part of uh, this network, these networks. And now I will talk about uh, the main concepts uh, and uh, the theoretical uh, uh, perspectives uh, with regards uh, to uh, public policy making networks. Uh, but beca before I go into theory, I want to compare it with uh, uh, certain perspectives related uh, to rational with certain uh, concepts, including rationality. In rationality, there is a new concept uh, that uh, public po the, the worker in public, public policy wants to achieve his uh, goals. Uh, but uh, withstanding other parties. Uh, so all parties uh, have certain goals they want to achieve, uh, but uh, rationality does not give us a comprehensive picture how this uh, player, for example, uh, develops uh, his uh, goals and ambitions in light uh, of the visions, ambitions, and goals of uh, other players and the relation within the network. And from here, the uh, the network perspective uh, gives us a more comprehensive picture of policy making without uh, uh, without concentrating on every participant. When we compare uh, this uh, perspective with uh, the perspective that we teach students uh, in uh, the BA policy, the, uh, the policy cycle. The policy cycle that includes, uh, like the doctor mentioned, the five or six main uh, phases uh, based on the model used. Uh, this model is very static. It gives us the stages, uh, the stages, but it, it does not delineate the, phase, the interaction within each stage. It does not concentrate on the relation between uh, the participating parties, uh, the power relations. Uh, since I am uh, a specialist in policy and political science, uh, the power relation within uh, public policy, uh, policy, uh, public policy network is very important. This is why we have to understand them. And instead of saying that uh, public policy making uh, is, uh, begins by determining the problem and then determining the uh, alternatives, assessing alternatives, uh, choosing alternative, uh, uh, reviewing assessment, uh, this is a very, there's a very static view of the uh, public policy, of public policy making. Uh, some uh, uh, some uh, grounds that, uh, s some main grounds, uh, the relational uh, nature. The uh, nature of relations, uh, the networks concentrate on relations uh, that are being built between uh, the participants, whether state or non-state. Uh, it also concentrates on interaction. It is interaction ground. How these uh, part, uh, 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 how these stakeholders interact. Uh, how do. Uh, how does the state interact with the private sector and the NGOs in order to. Uh, in order uh, to uh, make and implement uh, policies. And the relation between the parties is uh, uh, distinguished by interdependence, uh, i.e., there is no place within the public policy networks with regards uh, to free riders. Uh, if you are not interested, you are not uh, there. If you are not interested in the issue and the matter, you will not be a participating party uh, on the table uh, with regard to discussions uh, on this uh, issue. So every part, uh, so every Everyone within this network requires the other party. So reviewing uh, the visions of the Gulf states, uh, the national visions, of course, uh, the content analysis uh, of these national visions, the, the, 
the term pub, uh, private sector uh, is part and parcel of the dev development vision of these countries. So the state requires the, uh, the private sector in order to implement uh, the plans, and the private sector requires the public sector in order for to regulate its work uh, within the state. Uh, so relation here is interdependent. There is no party that depends on the other party uh, uh, fully. Uh, so. So relations also with another are strategic. Every party tries uh, to use uh, the available resources in a rational manner, in a manner that allows him to achieve his goals. From the beginning, we cannot say who is the party that will achieve his goal completely, because we cannot achieve goals completely within uh, 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 public policy networks. Uh, but uh, it is a form of interactions. Of interactions, uh, we formulate different visions, uh, alternatives uh, with regards to dealing uh, with the problem of policies. Uh, we can guide interactions in a way or another. I will uh, uh, shed light on some strategy that will allow those who manage public policy making networks uh, to manage interactions. But from the beginning, we cannot say that uh, this is that this is the result that we will uh, get to through interaction because it's an open process and every uh, party tries to guide interaction in a way that allows him to uh, achieve their goals from here. Uh, public policy making uh, is uh, a form of uh, game theory because here the games are not uh, are not zero-sum uh, games, uh, but it is actually a game uh, that has uh, many rounds. Uh, so if you lose a round, uh, you can win in another round uh, because uh, the, uh, the, there are many rounds in the game uh, and uh, the part different parties can achieve their goals, uh, be it uh, partially or in the different uh, stages and phases of interaction. Uh, this uh, perspective is based on different theories uh, of political science and uh, policy theories uh, and uh, management theories and organization theories. But uh, to respect time, uh, 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 I will move forward and I will leave this to your questions uh, quickly. This is a summary of a group of strategies provided by the literature on uh, public policy networks, but uh, I do not have time uh, to explain them. But I would like to reiterate here that there was a change in the manner where, uh, where uh, non, uh, non where in the command and control, uh, uh, so command and control uh, uh, needs to be changed into soft guidance. by using these strategies. And some strategies uh, are on the level of interactions that take place between the different parties uh, of uh, public policy networks. On the second, some strategies are on the composition of these networks. And those who play a role of uh, the director of the networks can use these strategies in order to change interactions. Uh, I have concentrated on one of uh, on, on a policy tools uh, that you that are used by policymakers uh, in uh, many sectors including uh, the telecom sector uh, before uh, any uh, decision that regulate the sector regulatory authorities uh, uh, launch a consultation process uh, between NGOs the private sector in order to give their ideas uh, uh, with regards to solving certain issues related to policies here I've concentrated uh, on a consultation process with regards to licensing satellite services uh, that was undertaken by the regulatory authority in Qatar in 2013. The model here really summarizes this network. It is a very simple network that is made up of five main players. In red are the public uh, uh, parties, uh, the ministry, uh, MOTC, and the ICT that is now uh, and here we have three other stakeholders, three companies from the private sector. They are interacting uh, within this uh, issue with regards to licensing the satellite uh, services. If we if we move to another issue, we will perhaps we will see more participants. Hence, uh, the uh, the network be, will be more complex. The more parties we have in the network, the more complex the networks. Complicated, the more uh, interactions. Be, uh, uh, the more interactions we have, the more relations we have. Here are some strategies that I did not have time uh, to shed light on. For example, the. Action, take, action taking uh, process. As I've said, we do not have free riders. You still have one minute, doctor. So only those, uh, so uh, 
as I said, there are no free riders. If you uh, if you are interested, you'll be part of the network. So this network has uh, entered into action uh, after uh, during the consultation process. If we have other issues, perhaps we'll have new players that will be added uh, to this network. The second strategy is uh, the framing strategy or reframing actually strategy. Uh, framing is uh, affecting really the decisions of uh, policy makers, i.e. the regulatory authority or the MOTC here drafts a consultation paper that presents its vision on how to regulate uh, this matter. So hence, each party will present his vision, his idea, his opinion, and then we will have uh, uh, a, 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 a general or a comprehensive opinion on how to manage this issue. So did, uh, did the, the question that should be asked, uh, did the state uh, lose its control on the decision-making process? My answer is, of, of course not, uh, but the role of the state has changed from 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 the uh, from the policy maker and implement uh, and implementer to a regula regulator it is a regulatory state uh, it implement it really issues the regulations uh, that regulate the relation between different parties in the networks and uh, uh, this perspectives uh, give us uh, a more dynamic picture, uh, a more interactive picture, a more rea uh, uh, realistic picture with regards to public policy making and implementation. in comparison to other static models that do not take uh, this interactive perspective into consideration. Thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to answer all your questions uh, uh, at the end of this session. Thank you, Dr. Ahman. It is a very valuable uh, paper. I am sure that uh, our guests here and participants have a lot of questions with regards uh, to uh, those uh, uh, to the, uh, with, the, with the relation between state and non-state uh, parties. Our next paper is by Dr. Yusuf, uh, is to be presented by Dr. Yusuf Hamad Al-Belushi. He is a Oman researcher. He has a PhD from King's College in London in political economy. He was uh, a uh, consultant in the IMF. Uh, he is the author of numerous studies and book chapters, most recently, Challenges and Horizons of the Oman 2020 Future Vision, and analytic reading in economic diversification in the Gulf states. He is also the editor of two books, one on diversification in the GCC. Dr. Yusuf's paper is entitled Public Policy Making in the Gulf States, uh, the Case of Oman. Assalamu alaikum. My paper uh, pertains to the Sultanate of Oman, but uh, in reality, all the GCC states are going through uh, growth. Public policy making is uh, very important. In uh, the uh, GCC uh, region today, development hinges upon a, uh, a set of policies, uh, economic, financial, social policies that identify or outline our uh, path. Uh, this paper will focus on the economic uh, dimension of uh, policies and will intersect with uh, some of the points raised by Mr. Badran. Uh, the first uh, aspect uh, is uh, about uh, the achievement and planning uh, path in uh, Oman. From 1970, the first fifth year uh, plan and uh, vision, uh, Omani Vision 2020, to the 10 year uh, plan that is underway now, which is uh, Oman Vision 2040. Uh, but what is important here is that all GCC states, including Oman, has achieved uh, development uh, leaps, uh, but uh, now it is uh, time to, uh, uh, for transformation in these uh, countries for several considerations. The future uh, is owned by those who create it, uh, whether Oman or other GCC states. Uh, they, um, those countries uh, have the tools required to build their future, but here we should take into consideration several points. 
starting by the determinants of uh, pu public uh, policy making and why policies in Oman and the GCC states should uh, change. In my opinion, demographic, the demographic uh, development, uh, the uh, rise in uh, population, the uh, increasing uh, demands uh, and expectations of the citizens makes it uh, um, necessary for uh, Oman and GCC states to uh, achieve such transformation. Also, the fourth industrial revolution will uh, deeply affect uh, one of the most compo uh, most important component of uh, growth, uh, which is oil. And we will see uh, the challenges uh, uh, pertaining to oil. Also, uh, we will speak about the ready readiness of these uh, countries. These countries uh, spent uh, generously on the infrastructure of its ports and uh, airports, but now they should move into reaping the advantages of what they uh, build, uh, i.e. the industrial cities and the infrastructure. So now we should start uh, we should start benefiting from what we achieved. Oman has achieved a 3.5% growth, which is a regular percentage. But here, the challenge in development is tightly linked to the changes in oil prices. The green line here is about the annual uh, growth. So the question, was Oman successful in managing the uh, previous stage? Of course, uh, and uh, thank God, in Oman and uh, as Omanis, we can feel uh, how uh, much the uh, public uh, policies were uh, successful, especially uh, in achieving uh, psychological uh, stability and security in the region. Oman readiness uh, uh, is uh, now deemed mature, and we can start uh, and we should start uh, benefiting or maximizing the uh, advantages of uh, the previous stage. I summed up public policies in Oman. It is the same model as in the GCC state. Uh, it says that uh, there were development strides uh, in uh, the GCC state uh, in all uh, domains, uh, human development, women empowerment, uh, diplomacy. However, uh, such uh, development strides are interrupted and not sustainable but because they are tightly linked to oil. So, um, Oman has uh, achieved growth in nine oil sectors uh, around 7%, uh, and uh, those figures are uh, real and positive. Uh, Non-oil sectors uh, grew by 1.1%. However, the contribution of a uh, nine oil sector uh, stands at 55% now, uh, and the overall uh, growth was only 3.4%. Uh, percent uh, for that uh, reason. The World Bank and other international institutions uh, classified Oman as one of the uh, countries that achieved uh, growth over the past uh, 30 years. However, we cannot uh, stay st say that uh, Oman is secure and uh, now and can sleep on its laurels. Why? Because we rely heavily on the hydrocarbon sector. Uh, we have uh, shortages in uh, production elements. Uh, in the GCC states, uh, uh, the production, uh, uh, the productivity of uh, infrastructure is uh, minus uh, below uh, zero. In Oman, we have vast spaces, we have natural resources, we have good relationship with the rest of the world. So what remains is that we modify our uh, present or current public policy so that we can shift to uh, the uh, targeted uh, model and we shift towards uh, productivity sectors. Uh, here, 7.7 oh, uh, growth, like I said, uh, Oman used to be uh, a non-modern uh, state. Uh, we didn't have uh, uh, 
laws we didn't have a central uh, bank in the uh, following uh, stage uh, here uh, we uh, set out uh, a vision 2020 and we grew by f uh, 3.5 percent uh, we um, so, so this is uh, the uh, planning and uh, growth uh, stage and uh, uh, here uh, now we should move to the uh, next stage uh, which is uh, critical uh, to uh, the future of uh, the Sultanate of Oman and we rely here on the cooperation of other GCC states uh, and the in fact the blockade of uh, Qatar affected us uh, in uh, Oman so uh, now uh, we are speaking about uh, uh, energy transformation uh, policies uh, internal uh, <coughs> policies, development, whether a short or a long term uh, development. Uh, and any economic cycle uh, goes through this, uh, these uh, three stages. Uh, financial policies uh, are the key driver here for uh, development to be successful. So uh, public uh, policies that are implemented are the key determinant uh, of the success or failure of the uh, country. And, uh, and in my opinion, the uh, GCC states uh, so far were successful in building the modern state, uh, but uh, in the next stage, uh, it is inevitable to uh, move uh, to a, a new uh, a model uh, which uh, includes uh, a game uh, theory uh, component uh, uh, and uh, engages or involves the uh, private sector and the civil uh, society. The government should also move into a modern uh, role, uh, one that involves the citizens. Citizens have uh, diverse uh, interests. The private sector have uh, interests that are different than that of the uh, public sector and therefore we should uh, see how the uh, public uh, policies can reflect all that and we can see how all this uh, can be included in the public uh, sector. Oman has achieved uh, several uh, achievements and we already have the uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, ground to uh, move uh, forward. We have a uh, good economy, we have infrastructure. There are uh, shortcomings, uh, especially uh, economic uh, shortcomings, uh, uh, the gap between the public sector, the private sector, the restructuring of the uh, public sector. And in Oman, we have uh, challenges that we should uh, tackle. Uh, integration with the global economy is, in my opinion, uh, the uh, uh, Troy uh, horse that we require. Oman is a, uh, it has a prominent uh, and outstanding position. It has friendly ties with uh, the rest of the world, and uh, we should build on uh, that to uh, source what we need from friendly markets, especially IT. What are the uh, reasons behind uh, those uh, challenges? It is uh, how uh, transformational public policies are um, governed, are managed. Uh, so uh, Oman was uh, tied also to the uh, recent uh, crisis inside the uh, region and it was affected by uh, those uh, crises. Uh, as you can see in this uh, picture, Oman is bedridden just like any other GCC state, and this is because of the oil barrel. Oil barrels and oil barrels prices are subjected to uh, international challenges and the law of uh, demand and uh, supply. And this patient that you see in the uh, picture should start to uh, recover uh, now uh, for us to survive this uh, stage and uh, to overcome those challenges. On the uh, demand side, we see uh, improved uh, IT, we see uh, <coughs> uh, 
uh, oil uh, production and on the supply uh, excuse me this was on the supply uh, side on the demand side we see that uh, many uh, countries uh, issued law to uh, use renewable energy to uh, ban conventional vehicles uh, so uh, there are pressures on both the demand and the uh, supply side uh, and it won't be judicial f uh, for us to rely on uh, the uh, oil uh, prices only. All our financial policies should be reformed for the next stage so that we can uh, overcome the uh, challenge. Uh, it is inevitable now to move from a government only model to a, a government and public uh, private sector uh, model so partnership with the private sector is essential uh, we should also re-engineer our uh, public uh, policies to accommodate to accommodate the transformation we aspire we want transformation at the level of investment exportation and importation these are the titles for the next stage and they uh, broke a break away from uh, the titles of the earlier stage um, like uh, 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 dependence and uh, heavy reliance on uh, oil. Oman, just like any other state, uh, should uh, manage their uh, resources well through uh, good uh, policies, ones that are able to uh, provide or create a job opportunities, ones that are uh, able to uh, uh, make, uh, to, to rupture this uh, dependence uh, model on oil. Uh, public uh, policies are the engine for such a transformation and uh, saving is essential uh, to investment and in order to invest we should save and in order to uh, produce we should invest. So this is uh, uh, the relationship, uh, the fourth industrial revolution will uh, have its uh, impact and consequences, uh, of course, on the GCC states. We have uh, sectors that are not exploited yet, and we should uh, explore uh, ways uh, to start uh, tapping into uh, those uh, sectors. In conclusion, we uh, need to transform and move into a sustainable uh, model. The future of the GCC countries rests in the hands of its citizens. Uh, but uh, we require uh, new and evolving uh, public uh, policies and we need to strengthen our strategic uh, uh, relations uh, between uh, GCC states uh, but also with the world. Thank you, Mr. Youssef, for your uh, paper. You uh, highlighted uh, economic uh, development in the Sultanate and the uh, challenges faced uh, by the uh, Sultanate of Oman and other GCC states uh, uh, in terms of relying heavily on the hydrocarbon-based uh, economy. You also uh, shed light uh, on how private sector and uh, uh, CSOs should be involved in decision uh, making. Thank you for uh, sticking to uh, the uh, time. The next uh, paper, uh, the last one, will will be delivered by um, Dr. Hilal Al-Habsi. He is a researcher in uh, the Oman Shura Council. Uh, he uh, uh, has uh, he uh, is the author of a study on parliamentary elections in the Gulf, published in Shurufat. He also worked in uh, development uh, um, in uh, Oman, uh, and uh, his thesis was titled Constitution Transformations in the Sultanate of Oman and their social and political ramifications. Thank you, Doctor. The Gulf Representative Councils is a comparative, informing public policy in GC countries, a comparative uh, study with regards to public policy making in the GCC. Parliaments are a tool to achieve democracy. Representative democracy is the most common democracy and the most sustainable form of democracy. Parliaments are the best means to achieve political participation in an organized and institutionalized manner.
The study covers the following councils. The, the Gulf Representative Council in the UAE, uh, in the Gulf Council in Bahrain, Oman, and the Shura Council in Qatar of Qatar, and the Umma Council in uh, Kuwait. The Popular Representative Councils. Uh, this is the first uh, point, the electoral system and its impact on the performance of parliaments, uh, the reality of uh, performance uh, and the system of work, the uh, constitutional uh, competencies uh, and the relation of the parliament with the executive uh, uh, authority, uh, executive power or authority, uh, the internal uh, uh, laws or, or bylaws, the national assemblies, uh, the institutional form and parliamentary role. The National Assemblies represent the people. They represent the people in the judicial authority, the government. And the third authority, of course, is the People's Authority. These assemblies represent the authority of the people in the roles played by the parliament. Of course, legislation is the first role of parliament because the people is the one that determines the legislation form that governs social interaction. The people is the one that choose the proper legislation and not the government. If the government has a role, even though the government has a role in suggesting certain legislative needs, but uh, the final, uh, but uh, the final decision is taken by the parliament or the national assembly. The second duty or role is uh, the monitoring, uh, the role of monitoring. Uh, the, uh, the people, of course, monitor the government, uh, uh, the, the performance of the government, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the government's use of resources. Uh, the people has the right uh, to control and monitor the performance of the government uh, and uh, to and to either to give it trust, to, to give trust to government or withdraw its trust from the government. It is the role of the government has is also a, ha, the parliament also has a legislative role, not only to ratify or endorse international conventions and agreements. International conventions and agreements are not a popular demand, but actually a, a foreign demand. Perhaps Dr. Youssef can correct me here. The endorsement or ratification of international conventions uh, really is part of the change that Dr. Youssef mentioned earlier. International, the community, the international community requires uh, the endorsement of the parliament uh, on these conventions, not only that of the government. Uh, why is that? It is the result of political, uh, uh, of, pol of political events. You remember the events uh, of uh, uh, of June in Egypt, uh, Abdel Nasser. Uh, nationalized uh, the Suez Canal, but after uh, the coup d'etat of Abdel Nasser, all conventions uh, were, uh, were uh, of course, uh, were, were obliterated. Uh, the, the, the new government uh, uh, wanted to enter into new conventions. The international organizations with other events and other wants conventions to be endorsed by parliaments. Why? Because the governments are not sustainable accordingly in the light uh, of the change of revolution, be it as a revolution or democratic change. The, the government, of course, uh, will go, and along with it goes the, its obligations. But the parliament, the endorsement of the parliament to these conventions uh, is sustainable because it has been endorsed by the people, because these are conventions that will be, uh, that will be, of course, done, agreements that will be done with the people represented in the parliament, interactions with the different components of the state. 
the role of the parliament is just to preserve, preserve interaction within the society. In case of the failure of the government policies, uh, of course, we will see that uh, uh, we will have popular angers, and uh, the people will have hope in the parliament, because the parliament is uh, the power that institutes change. If there is no parliament, uh, the popular anger will increase. Accord, and this will lead to revolutions and rebellions. Uh, but uh, if there is uh, a parliament that is approved by the people, uh, the discontent, uh, the rage, the anger, of course, will uh, be alleviated uh, through the intervention of the parliament. Sometimes the governance uh, will uh, take uh, hurtful decisions, uh, 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 certain very harsh decisions uh, that could not uh, be shouldered by the government. And they uh, take recourse to the parliament in order uh, to take uh, such decisions and uh, put the burden on the shoulders of the representatives of the people. How do parliaments fulfill their role? They fulfill their role through two parts. The first part is through the mechanism of work of the parliament. Are, are the members elected members or not? Uh, and then the uh, the role of the parliament, its competence, uh, its jurisdiction stated by the constitution. The electoral system in the GCC state councils, three Gulf states uh, have electoral laws, and three countries uh, have electoral systems uh, that are framed uh, by executive laws. What is uh, the difference between the electoral law and the executive law? The electoral law gives power to the people. Electoral practices really uh, promotes uh, the culture of public participation. Elections. Through elections, the people choose their representatives. If we have democ if we have uh, free uh, elections, uh, here the responsibility falls on the shoulder of the people. You are the ones who have chosen your representatives. But if uh, but uh, if the members of parliament are appointed, or if there is partial election, here the burden will not be shouldered by the people because the people did not choose their representatives. No matter the practice of elections uh, implemented in the GCC, uh, no, no matter the form of elections, uh, this is positive because it shows that there is a change in the mindset of the political systems within the GCC countries. Free and direct elections provides uh, the member of parliament the freedom to work without any restrictions because in case of nomination or appointment uh, the mp the appointed mp cannot criticize the performance of the government why because in the next round uh, he will not be appointed again while uh, the elected uh, member who was uh, freely elected by the people uh, uh, takes recourse in his electoral base he is not afraid of the government he is not afraid of the decision of the government that should be that could be taken against him in the future because uh, he has been elected by the people and the same people who have voted for him in this round will vote for him again in the next round of elections Of course, the uh, reality of performance and the system of work uh, in the National Assembly, these assemblies are very recent. Uh, there are the parliaments have gradual competencies uh, that have been accumulated uh, through the years. The more the older the parliament, the greater the competencies and jurisdiction of the parliament. Its power and authorities will grow with the years. Of course, election gives, legis le gives legitimacy to the parliament in comparison to appointment, of course. 
If the assembly, if the parliament was established for a consultation uh, role, then the role has been delineated. He cannot transcend this role. But if, if he has a regulatory and supervisory role through this role, he can, of course, uh, uh, perform his uh, its duties, uh, constitutional competencies. The competencies mentioned in the Constitution delineate uh, the role of the Parliament. The jurisdictions of the, the jurisdiction of the or the competencies of the parliament should be determined and delineated in the constitution and not in the bylaws of the parliament. What is the difference? The difference is that the constitution regulates the authorities and within the state it determines the authority of the parliament while the bylaws of the parliament determines the executive processes and procedures and does not delineate or determine the competencies of the parliament. Uh, here, uh, in case uh, there is any uh, uh, discord between the parliament and the government, uh, we take recourse into the constitution. Uh, the bylaw is not uh, uh, the bylaw is not uh, uh, is not taken seriously by the government. Acknow actually, acknowledged by the government. Internal organization and its role in promoting the role of the parliament. The parliament. Uh, uh, the, the internal organization of the parliament and the parliamentary committees uh, should uh, cover the uh, uh, should cover the work of the government and not not in number and quantity but it can actually look into the different roles of the governments i.e parliamentary committees uh, or the competence of these parliamentary committees uh, should uh, really go in part or should cover the competencies of the different ministries uh, in the government the more uh, the, uh, the greater the number of parliamentary committees, uh, the more these committees are able to govern the different uh, work or duties and roles of uh, the ministries. Uh, the, the committees should have uh, research centers and should not depend on government research centers because the nature of uh, the parliament uh, requires critical studies, different critical studies uh, that are different from the studies that are presented by research centers that are affili affiliated to the government. Also, it is very important uh, for uh, uh, for the parliaments to have training centers uh, because uh, training center because the parliament uh, should really hone the skills uh, of uh, the MPs. Uh, especially, uh, there should be electronic networks uh, between the government and the parliament in order uh, to uh, provide access to different forms of information uh, that are required by the parliament and the studies undertaken uh, by the different committees of the parliament and different parliamentary members. Of course. Uh, 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 parliamentary immunity is very important for the for the role of parliamentary members. Uh, this allows them uh, to perform their duties without being scared, of course, uh, uh, from uh, any uh, action that might be taken by the governments against uh, the parliamentary members in case of uh, criticism of the role and duties of uh, the government. For it, the the Shura Council and KSA, even though it is, uh, even though the members of the council are appointed, uh, the, the members have no immunity by the constitution. There are certain. There are certain cases, of course, with regards uh, to parliamentary immunity, and this depends on the competence of the jury. Uh, the immunity of uh, parliamentary members is stated, uh, of course, by law, with re uh, by law. But uh, there are certain justifications uh, that could be made in order uh, to uh, in order to take mar parliamentary members to court. Parliamentary diplomacy. It is the main role of uh, Gulf parliaments. Uh, the par I think this is uh, this is a government trap that is given uh, to the uh, to, to the parliament. Uh, the government, uh, of course, encourage parliamentary members uh, to take uh, part in uh, different uh, missions uh, abroad. Thank you. 
thank you for shedding light on uh, the different roles of national assemblies and the representative councils in the GCC and the effective role that these councils play. We have 30 minutes for Q&A. I think it is ample time. We will start by taking your questions. Please state your name and be brief in your questions. Thank you. My name is Mohammed Jakai from Oman. My question is to Dr. Hilal Al Habsi. Your uh, paper is entitled uh, The Role of National Assembly in the GCC States uh, in Policy Making. You spoke about uh, the role um, of a parliament, uh, and uh, those uh, roles apply to all parliaments uh, across the world, so uh, making legislation, ratifying uh, international conventions. But you didn't speak uh, about uh, the uh, role of uh, parliamentarians uh, in uh, traveling for diplomacy. Uh, do uh, Parliament uh, have uh, a uh, real supervisory or oversight role, but uh, are they only complementary to the uh, modern uh, state? The uh, Kuwait National uh, Assembly uh, was uh, one of those uh, cases. Regarding uh, the uh, free uh, and direct poll elections, uh, there are uh, elections uh, to, uh, of national uh, assemblies. In Oman, we have uh, one. But here, uh, what is the relationship between the direct poll of uh, uh, electing those national assembly and the uh, management of uh, the, uh, of uh, such elections by the uh, executive uh, branch. Uh, in my opinion, the executive branch shouldn't be managing uh, elections because there is conflict here. Uh, the judiciary uh, should be the one uh, managing uh, the election. Do you believe that uh, national assemblies in the GCC uh, should uh, have uh, a higher uh, committee to uh, manage elections instead of having elections uh, managed by the executive branch. Do you uh, believe that this proposition can uh, be escalated uh, uh, or submitted to the Shura uh, Council for serious review? Uh, why do you believe that the uh, GCC state uh, doesn't uh, uh, call their uh, national assemblies as parliament? Why do they fear the word parliament? <laughs> Mohammed bin Saleh Saadi from Qatar. My question uh, goes to uh, Mr. Hilal as well. Regarding uh, the uh, legislative uh, assemblies, whether you want to call it uh, uh, parliament or Shura Council, I do not, I do not know. The uh, common uh, role is uh, to issue legislations and uh, to oversee the implementation thereof. But in your opinion, what are the other roles that uh, national assemblies uh, sh uh, undertake in terms of development? For example, we have uh, listened to uh, Mr. Yusuf's presentation, and we agree with him that uh, development requires specific and new uh, mechanisms. And those mechanisms, in turn, require uh, competence and uh, uh, speed in uh, making decisions. Uh, what is your uh, take on uh, developing a parliamentarian process? Uh, the uh, parliamentarian uh, action uh, currently focuses on the uh, or should focus on uh, the importance of uh, development. Uh, we uh, see that uh, uh, the GCC states uh, have completed their infrastructure uh, plans and uh, their laws are actually reliable and they uh, govern all uh, contracts uh, to uh, to uh, 
to uh, implement contracts. But uh, there is a component inside these com uh, uh, contracts uh, to uh, also uh, refer to uh, English uh, courts. So uh, how uh, can we uh, break away from uh, the uh, English uh, courts by uh, triggering uh, a development inside the national assemblies themselves, but also by triggering uh, development uh, in a society. Thank you, Mr. Nasser. Assalamu alaikum Nasser al -Saadi. Thank you for your uh, papers. Dr. Yusuf, I have a uh, short intervention. I wish for you to give me your opinion on it. I believe that in Oman, the uh, largest uh, issue or the largest problem uh, is unemployment, uh, the lack of job opportunities, at least in the short term. In your opinion, does it uh, uh, is the reason the inability of the private uh, sector to create uh, new jobs? What is the uh, reason of, of this uh, problem? Um, I have a question to Mr. Hapsi as well. And I will be uh, taking the case of uh, Oman because we are Omanis uh, and more experienced in uh, this uh, field. In your opinion, Uh, what is uh, the role of the National Assembly in every governorate? Also, uh, the uh, tribalism in Oman uh, is uh, the uh, reference to select the representatives or the candidates for the National uh, Assembly. And we see sometimes that uh, illiterate candidates uh, are elected to the National Assembly. So in your opinion, and uh, by the way, Uh, uh, now, uh, the law allows for a student who uh, passed uh, th the uh, grade three to uh, take uh, any uh, to take uh, high school uh, or secondary uh, exam and uh, take a certificate. So, uh, my question here: uh, How can tribalism? Uh, Top affecting uh, candidature for a national assembly. Next question. You, uh, we listened to your paper, but uh, it seems uh, you left out the most important segment thereof, i.e., policy making. You said that uh, Gulf uh, National Assemblies or parliaments uh, are uh, are not old, but in Ecuador, the first uh, parliament dates back to 1937. Uh, you also said that uh, the uh, people are the ones who uh, determine the format uh, or the composition of uh, the uh, parliament. You also said that uh, Gulf uh, Parliament and uh, their uh, varied uh, forms can withdraw the uh, trust from the government. But give me an example. When did that ever uh, happen? My uh, question, uh, my next question goes to Mr. Fathi. You spoke about uh, uh, governance in uh, policy uh, making. Does that apply to uh, political lobbyists? Thank you. Mrs. Aisha. Thank you. Um, uh, my first question goes to Mr. Youssef. You mentioned uh, the relationship between the private sector and the uh, government, and you spoke about uh, economic diversification. In reality, uh, we uh, 
see that uh, the relationship between the uh, private sector and the government uh, is uh, a bit uh, shaky, but we always say that the private sector is the one that will shape the future. But now we uh, see how uh, a relationship is directly drawn between uh, these two, and we are aware that the private sector cannot uh, move forward with any uh, project unless the private sector or the government uh, provides the appropriate funding. Uh, also, uh, in economic uh, diversification, um, we uh, see that uh, oil and gas sector is the engine for economy, but now the future uh, rests on economic diversification. However, our uh, budget uh, and every year we are surprised that more than 70% of the national budget relies on uh, oil exclusively. Uh, and uh, not uh, on economic uh, diversification and uh, nine oil uh, sectors. So until when this uh, model? Mr. Hilal, your uh, paper is about national assemblies. I will not uh, uh, repeat uh, the uh, questions of my colleagues, but you said that uh, in, uh, in uh, parliaments, uh, Parliaments uh, are backed by the uh, people and therefore they do not try uh, to flirt with the uh, government. However, the uh, parliaments that are appointed or backed by the uh, government uh, try uh, to uh, flirt uh, with the uh, government uh, to ensure their sustainability. Uh, we know that uh, parliaments has uh, their own uh, objectives even when they are backed by the people. So what's your take on that? Uh, today's session is Omani by excellence. Thank you, uh, doctor. And I would uh, like uh, to thank uh, the other speakers as well. Uh, a problem of development is that uh, development uh, is uh, not at the uh, uh, is not at the heart of uh, national plans. Mr. Youssef, you uh, mentioned uh, in the other room that uh, Professor Ahmed Musfer uh, gave a comment regarding the problematics and challenges uh, faced by the GCC state uh, when it comes to uh, population uh, and demographics. And he proposed naturalization of Arab citizens to uh, solve uh, this demographic uh, gap. In your uh, paper, uh, you said that uh, successful solutions for uh, prosperity uh, should focus on uh, national workforce. So are there like contradiction between uh, economic aspects and security related aspects or it's only a diversion in uh, points of view? Uh, my next question is <coughs> to Dr. Aisha, when you uh, spoke about uh, uh, appointed uh, parliament versus uh, elected uh, parliament, uh, I believe that parliaments that are appointed uh, can uh, have a harsher criticism on the government than parliaments that are elected. And therefore, what Mr. Habsi said is uh, true. Uh, so even if the competences and the functions of the parliament are the same, the uh, difference is that uh, uh, elected uh, parliament uh, have uh, a, uh, an oversight role uh, more than the appointed uh, parliaments. And I agree with him. Last uh, question before 
uh, giving uh, the floor back okay. to the speakers. Hiba Farid, Director General of uh, uh, Development and Public Policy Center in Sudan. I would like to thank the three speakers for their valuable papers. Yes, it is true that uh, stages uh, of uh, public policy making are about six stages, but uh, there are a lot of uh, challenges. Um, uh, we uh, do a uh, stakeholder mapping or analysis to include uh, all stakeholders' propositions because we believe that uh, uh, they should be given priority in uh, providing their input to in uh, making policy so that source policies achieve the best outcomes po possible. Second comment, uh, we uh, see that uh, in a certain uh, country, informal actors, non-state uh, actors, like uh, uh, actors uh, that are uh, not the legislative, executive, and judicial uh, branches, for example, uh, me the media, the private sector, the CSOs, uh, the academic institutions. So. Uh, Decision making in uh, the uh, Gulf has uh, an elitistic component uh, to it, uh, and uh, the elites are the one entrusted with uh, decision making. And therefore, we see that informal actors aren't uh, involved in uh, decision making, and this should uh, be uh, changed, in my opinion. I agree with Mr. Yusuf. We um, we all in the Arab region should should uh, um, uh, make uh, good uh, public uh, policies because uh, public policies are the only solution for us to evolve. Mr. <coughs> Hapsi, if we uh, give uh, the uh, National Assembly the role of uh, making public uh, policies, uh, there should be uh, technical mechanisms, there should be specialized uh, committees and uh, people who are capable of making analysis and providing alternative uh, within the uh, National Assembly so that uh, its uh, role uh, is not restricted to oversight only. I am happy with this uh, discussion, and uh, I am happy that uh, most uh, comments uh, are about my paper. Muhammad uh, al uh, throughout uh, my uh, analysis, uh, I relied on your publications without meeting you in person, but now I uh, met you in a uh, person. A, uh, a real uh, legislative oversight within a state of institution. This is uh, uh, a uh, prerequisite, of course. Uh, uh, parliaments uh, represent or embody the will of the uh, people uh, um, uh, as they are granted the power to make legislations and uh, and uh, oversee uh, the performance of the uh, government. Uh, this is, of course, uh, the ideal uh, picture. But what happens in reality is that there is a conflict between uh, the uh, legislative branch and the executive branch. Usually, the executive branch, the uh, government, is more influential because because it has uh, a lot of uh, uh, things uh, to control. Uh, parliaments, even if they uh, are freed from the uh, government's uh, control and they are now independent in performing their uh, competences, they can still be uh, subject uh, to uh, challenges. And those challenges can't be solved unless uh, by implementing the constitution. The uh, constitution uh, revolves around uh, a parliamentarian or a, a, a parliamentarian regime and a uh, monarchy. 
Recently, um, in the UK House of Common, the um, the uh, president of the Council of uh, Ministers uh, made a uh, proposition to uh, to freeze uh, the work of the parliament, and this was escalated to Her Majesty, uh, and uh, the parliament uh, won in this uh, in this uh, conflict. So uh, we see that the constitution itself uh, refers uh, all issues uh, eventually to the uh, queen or to the uh, king but uh, however the queen or the king uh, do not have uh, uh, does not have the right to uh, to uh, modify or to amend the constitution the constitution can only be amended through a popular referendum direct appalling uh, uh, relationship with the, uh, the legislative branch. Uh, recently, I uh, had a study uh, on the GCC states. All GCC states, uh, except for Oman, uh, have a judiciary control over the legislative uh, branch. In uh, Oman, uh, the uh, executive branch practices such a control. We have the higher uh, committee for elections. It uh, uh, plays the role of a higher uh, court, but it has executive officials uh, from the government in it. And according to international standards, this is not acceptable because uh, the uh, executive management of elections require uh, human uh, resources, a lot of human human resources, and uh, here we uh, use uh, civil uh, servants. If the elections are uh, managed by a uh, civil servant uh, only, uh, this will not be an issue. The issue is that uh, eventually the higher committee for elections is the one supervising and governing or managing the elections, and, and this uh, committee uh, respond uh, to uh, the uh, government. So there is uh, a questioning about uh, the transparency and uh, integrity in dealing with grievances and compliance, uh, complaints. Appointed or elected, of course, uh, I uh, believe that or uh, regarding uh, the So I believe that a parliament should be independent from the uh, government, and therefore, uh, therefore, uh, uh, the people, the parliament, uh, should be elected so that the parliament can discharge its functions uh, independently from the uh, government. Other. Uh, there are states uh, who that appoint their uh, parliament. They believe that a government can still or, sh or should still enjoy a certain extent of control over the uh, parliament. Dr. Uh, Nasser, uh, tribalism inside of a uh, governorate. Uh, this is like uh, a uh, social structure that you cannot uh, abolish. However, with the uh, with the uh, increasing mindset of political action in a society, we can uh, move slowly away from such uh, uh, tribalism. Uh, but you can see even in a democratic uh, state, uh, we do not have ideal uh, parliaments or ideal elections. And so I believe that uh, a tribe's representation cannot be abolished from the uh, parliament. Uh, I was observing uh, the uh, uh, the 
election of a student uh, inside a universities. Over the past five years, student assemblies and here we do not have a tribalism, uh, but we have the same uh, mindset. So, and we see that even in the election of student uh, uh, assemblies, women are not represented, despite the fact that these uh, assemblies are not or do not rely on a tribalism. Women failed uh, to uh, to access uh, the National Assembly, but uh, we expected to see more women representation inside student assemblies, knowing that uh, female students outnumber male students inside universities. In the uh, National University, uh, there are women elected. And uh, th there is women who there's uh, one woman who was elected to the presidency of the uh, assembly, the students' assembly. The students' uh, assembly now gather nine women compared to more than twenty males. One of the students that was uh, competing one of the female students uh, that were competing against a male uh, this uh, female student was uh, convinced or persuaded by uh, other uh, colleagues of hers to withdraw her candidature in the favor of a male a candidate. So when we have ambitions among males to uh, accede to a certain uh, position, they uh, place a pressure on a woman to uh, withdraw. I said that uh, legislations are uh, the people are the source of uh, legislations. The people determine how uh, legislations uh, should be. In 2011, uh, in the youth uh, spring, uh, we had the Ashura Council, which in turn uh, had a, a, uh, an advisory uh, committee. But after the um, demands of the youth in 2011, the government uh, accepted to uh, give the Shura Council oversight and uh, control uh, functions or competences. And in, uh, the, in these uh, protests, the uh, assemblies uh, had an, uh, a uh, had uh, bylaws that weren't uh, included in the uh, Constitution. But uh, after 2011, the Shura Council was afforded more uh, competences, and its bylaws uh, were included or stated in the uh, Constitution. Mrs. Aish and Mr. Ahmad, by camera. I uh, I uh, was talking about the bicameral uh, parliament. The uh, bicam uh, one of uh, the two uh, chamber is uh, elected. Uh, the other uh, chamber is uh, appointed. But uh, when I spoke about uh, elections, uh, I uh, was talking about the uh, uh, sh chamber that represents uh, the uh, people. The Federal uh, National Assembly in the uh, UAE is uh, half appointed and half uh, elected. Electoral uh, lists, uh, uh, electorate uh, uh, lists are uh, not uh, governed by any law. The uh, ruler of every emirate uh, decides what is the uh, form of the uh, electoral law. Thank you. Um, and um, 
I thank you for your questions. The first question, uh, that of Dr. Faham, is the understanding of public policy uh, include uh, lobbyists? Uh, in short, yes. And uh, but this requires uh, to uh, take into consideration developments in uh, political uh, sciences. Uh, pluralism uh, and corporatism are essential to see uh, how uh, these uh, actors can uh, interplay inside the uh, society uh, because uh, the interactions among uh, uh, society uh, players are important, including uh, that of uh, lobbyists. Today, we uh, see um, community science uh, uh, policies communities, and those communities, like research centers, uh, are essential in uh, drafting uh, policies and uh, visions for uh, solving uh, problems through policies inside the society. Dr. Hiba, the uh, uh, policy cycle model, I agree with you. Um, however, the uh, contribution of the uh, center focuses on interactions within every stage. For example, in the stage pertaining to the dra drafting of public uh, policies, in this stage there are several f actors that uh, work together in order to draft the public policy. And here, uh, the uh, problem is uh, a social uh, construct. It is the outcome of all inputs, of all um, insights uh, contrary to the uh, top-down uh, model whereby the government used to uh, draft a policy single-handedly. So uh, it is um, it is an addition to the uh, public policy-making network. The theory of the uh, elite uh, to explain the the reality in the GCC state, I agree with you, it is a good entry point to uh, understand policies in the uh, Gulf. However, it is, loses, it is losing ground to uh, more interactive entry points because even when uh, the elites uh, are uh, uh, putting forth uh, their uh, visions, uh, such visions are uh, engaging now the private sector in order to take their input. And here, if uh, we are to uh, assess the content of the national visions in the GCC, we uh, see uh, to which extent the uh, visions state the role of the private sector and the engagement with the private sector in implementing their uh, in implementing such visions. So the uh, governments are now uh, keen on. Um, on involving uh, the uh, private sector, and we see how the elitistic model is losing ground to uh, in favor of uh, private sector engagement. Regarding the unemployment uh, problem or diversification problem, when we speak about an economic uh, model, any uh, model should be uh, amended and modified uh, to keep up uh, with the uh, new issues, especially when it fails to address the uh, problem of unemployment. In Oman, the uh, p public sector is the main employer, and the uh, private sector also uh, relies on the public sector. So the private sector uh, imports from uh, other uh, markets, but uh, they sell uh, to the uh, private, uh, to the public uh, sector. There is 30% uh, uh, inflation inside the public uh, sector, and they should start to shrink uh, now. It is not sustainable uh, for the uh, public sector to uh, keep absorbing the number of uh, unemployed uh, persons by uh, forming new bodies, new ministers. So it is. Uh, this is causing inflation inside of the uh, public uh, sector, and uh, this uh, this is creating a fake uh, model, and the private sector is uh, left uh, out with uh, no real productivity. 
the uh, private sector reliance on the uh, public sector and because they lacked processing and uh, uh, manufacturing and because they are only like uh, retail sellers to the uh, public sector uh, makes it hard for uh, for them uh, i mean for the private sector to absorb or to create a new job opportunities uh, public uh, policies and the public financial policies were adequate but now we should move to the new role whereby the uh, private sector the uh, public sector and the individuals roles are uh, transformed to keep up with the modern uh, challenges and uh, to, uh, to to move into a model that taps into the uh, strength that uh, saw the light uh, over the past uh, years. Is it sustainable for the uh, public sector to keep funding I do not think so because our economy if you sp spend one real inside the country, there's a chance of having 900 paisa going outside of the country. There are remittances to outside the countries, there are imports, um, uh, and uh, a reliance on foreign services. So there's a, a chance, even if you award a, a bid to a private sector uh, company for example when when you uh, so when you uh, give a contract to a private sector uh, company you will be surprised that they are uh, bringing foreign workers from abroad and they are uh, bringing contractors from abroad so uh, a, a, a good a good uh, a deal of your funding will uh, go outside of the uh, country so like i said if you spend one real 90 percent of it will go abroad and will not uh, re-enter the uh, economic uh, the national economic uh, cycle so here uh, in the GCC state, there is a, an issue of uh, population. 60% of the uh, population is uh, illiterate. Uh, no, we do not need more uh, workforce. Uh, we need uh, more education. In Oman 2040, we have an objective uh, to attract uh, talent. Uh, and we are ready to uh, give citizenship to those uh, who are able to add value and uh, bring uh, skills uh, to Oman. So the uh, decreasing uh, population uh, rate isn't uh, Increasing the uh, population uh, rate uh, will not solve the uh, purchase uh, power problem. Uh, uh, today, uh, in the era of uh, globalization, exportations and importations, uh, increasing uh, population is not the answer. Uh, education is, we are all economists uh, and uh, and uh, we are aware that uh, this uh, uh, global interrelations uh, are uh, posing complications on our economy. Everything moves in the same uh, direction, uh, importation, exportation, etc. Oman um, and in a case they are to make uh, public uh, policies uh, those uh, new policies should be different than uh, previous uh, policies uh, and should uh, keep up with modern challenges like I said thank you Mr. Bah Badran, Mr. Balushi and Mr. Habzi for uh, your uh, inputs and uh, uh, discussion